Hey there, everybody. It's good to see you, I think. <laughs> it is a beautiful day in the beautiful Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina. As people are getting on here, uh, we're going to be talking about free stuff today and other implications of free stuff. Um, and speaking of free stuff, I went into the office yesterday, had a meeting, and on my desk was this cool t-shirt from one of Charlotte's hottest, newest uh, fintech companies that does artificial intelligence for billing and cash, cash flow. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so Anduin, and also just so you know, they were named the uh, top 20 or uh, in 2021, top one of the top new products by accounting today. So there you go. Um, so as you guys are getting on here, we're going to be talking about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, you know, I don't know if you saw it last night or have been reading about it recently, but there's about six trillion. I can't even count that many zeros. I don't know how many. It's more than my mind can comprehend uh, in new spending. So here's an interesting thought. BGW helps you save money, make money, stay out of trouble and have fun while doing it. We do not help you spend your money. We do not want to step on the toes of the federal government. So with that said, uh, oh, also we're doing a shout out to Clean Juice today because Adam is representing. Yes. Yeah, you can barely see it. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we're also going to be talking about restaurant. Uh, what, are, what is it? Restaurant Recovery Act? Or I don't remember what it's called. Uh, yeah. Restaurant something. Um, so. Adam or Jack, who, who wants to jump into the ring of fire first? Um, is there okay? So Jack can keep me honest and fact check me. Um, so a couple, a couple things um, just, you know, logistically to remember about. Um, number one is with the, you know, employee retention tax credit, you know, they're, probably twice a week now I'm getting emails from clients from companies that are soliciting business in exchange for a percentage of tax credit recovery. Um, you know, you do have to go through some work to figure out if you qualify and stuff like that. It's like, I, I'm kind of dubious. Well, it's not, I guess, I suppose it's not work or it's, it, it's, if, if, Hey, if it's, if, if you're not having to do any work and they're going to find it for you, you know, that's all great. I think my philosophical problem with that is I've never been a big fan of, Hey, I'm taking percentage of the credits that you were legally entitled to in, in the first place. Um, it's, so I just would encourage anybody on the call or you know, anybody that's advising customers that's on the call that, you know, look at the end of the day, it's pretty black and white, whether or not you qualify, this is not like a gray zone. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you qualify, it's not rocket science to calculate the amount of the credit and apply for the refund. <laughs> um, so why would you give up, you know, 20, 30 percent of that <laughs> for someone to do something that does not require, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the effort? I mean, spend two seconds to figure out whether or not you qualify, you know. Greater than 50 percent down if it's a 2020 credit, greater than 20 percent down if it's a 2021 credit. 2021 credit, or alternatively, I'm making the case that the government shut me down. Real simple. Um, so, with that, with that in mind, you know, we have had some clients this last week that that had questions around, you know, hey, you know, we qualify for the employer retention tax credit. It's a pretty big number. We'd like to go ahead and get an expedited refund. You know, having problems getting it. It's because the IRS is still revising the advanced credit form, presumably they'll also need to revise the nine, um, the 941s to reflect the other credits that were available as part of the stimulus that have you know, been largely um, not talked about. And those two credits are, you know, one, um, the government's picking up the tab for COBRA payments. So, you know, I don't know how many people this impacts, but it's just don't forget about it. I mean, what normally happens is you know, you pay the health insurance bill on behalf of your employee, and then you turn around and the employee reimburses you for that payment. When I say employee, former employee, 
now you're cutting the employee out of the question and getting money from the government. So it's just like one of those things to not forget about, <laughs> you know, don't forget about it. Um, the second is, you know, if you give people time off and um, don't make them take sick leave or PTO to get vaccinated, um, then you can get a credit for that. And that's, that's live. That's happened at BGW. Like we haven't applied for credit yet, but you know, we have had people that have had adverse reactions to shot number two um, that have either taken the day off or taken a partial day off. So don't, I mean, I know everybody has probably experienced that before. So don't forget about that one either, because that's a pretty decent credit, but that's what they're waiting to revise um, the, for, the forms for. Um, and then lastly, um, on my uh, opening tirade, um, Gary, uh, I will I will try to remain apolitical uh, yeah. for your benefit. Good, so your social media that. doesn't blow. <laughs> yeah. So the you know we're the on the, on the tax front associated with the president's um, speech last night. You know I've 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 already started receiving you know the text te the text and I'd had the questions beforehand. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to steal Jack's phrase. So this is, this is an Adam theory, you know, um, which is, you know, closely aligned to a Jack theory. <laughs> um, so this is an Adam theory on what's the most likely outcome on the tax front. So, you know, most likely outcome on the tax front, and this is literally in the order in which I believe it will come true. <laughs> um, most likely on the tax front is number one, enforcement. So they've asked for $80 billion to beef up the IRS. The IRS has been woefully understaffed. I mean, we deal with them every day and it's freaking awful to deal with them. Um, so the, the, the speculation, you know, and there, if, you, if you look at kind of the, the Pinocchio, like, was this true or not? You know, if you look at the Pinocchios on the, hey, let's just enforce the, the, the code that we got, which even Senator Manchin agrees with, you know, the, the, the conservative estimate is that there's about a trillion, that's one trillion, one T-R-I-L-L-I-O-N, if I spelled that correctly, <laughs> in, in unpaid taxes every year with high income earners. And, you know, what's happened in the past is that, the, you know, based on different regimes, I'm not, you know, knocking it one way or the other, but, you know, the, the government's primarily targeted low income earners that, you know, fraudulently did the earned income tax credit, um, which, you know, leads to some recovery and they're, you know, anybody in my business, you know, knows about the loan me your dependents so I can claim them for the credit scam that happens in that, in that area. It's awful. Um, but at the same time, just like I was really surprised when I first started hearing about PVP fraud, and we had all these clients who were worried about PVP fraud in terms of like, oh my gosh, they're going to come after me if I really didn't need the money. No, they're coming off of pe after people who lie about payroll, meaning they make up payroll they never actually had or a business that doesn't actually exist. When the government's talking about high income avoid, you know, fraud, they're not talking about like, hey man, I maybe got a little bit of aggressive or I pushed the line a little bit. Um, no, they're talking about literally you know, didn't report stuff. <laughs> and what I can tell you, based on my experience, you know, I'm going to knock on the wooden bookshelves behind me here um, and swear on my son Miles's life that he's 16 now. <laughs> so these are very old pictures that are sitting behind me. Um, that, you know, honestly, you know, we started in 2006 through various man you know, manifestations of the firm you know, through acquisitions really started in 1983. Anyway, um, the number of times that we've had an audit that uncovered unreported income, you know, is like one <laughs> in all that time span. And it wasn't something that happened on our watch. It was on a predecessor's watch. So, you know, we, we rarely have audit adjustments and we're extremely aggressive. That's because we're extremely aggressive in a legal way. <laughs> So what I found with the IRS is that, you know, generally, while you may have a complete jackass for an auditor, which even that's rare, but you may have a jackass, 
generally their supervisors are pretty reasonable people. And if they're not reasonable, then the next place that you appeal to it is generally pretty reasonable. So, you know, believe it or not, you know, they're kind of pro, hey, I want to figure out a way to make this work. I'm just crossing the I's and dying the T's for you um, versus generally, um, hey, I'm out to get you. <laughs> Um, so I'm not particularly concerned about the enforcement and, and I say, and it's, you know, and I don't like defending audits. I mean, they suck because I view them as a waste of time because there's nothing to find on our clients, but I'm generally for going after people who are committing fraud. You know, they should do that. If that, especially if that, that true, if they, if it's a trillion dollars, like truly is a trillion dollars, like most estimates have. No tax increase required. <laughs> that plus economic growth pretty well covers off on your deficit in this entire spending bill. So that's number one is I think they'll go after, I think, I think all parties will agree that enforcing the code that we already have makes sense. But I, have no, I don't fear that. I mean, I had, a, I had a client that texted me earlier today. It's like, I hear that the IRS is going to ask for the inflows and outflows of your bank accounts. Guess what? When you get audited, that's exactly what they do anyway. Nothing to fear. <laughs> um, that's why we ask for what we ask for when we when we do a tax return. I think the second most likely thing to happen, um, and the second and third are, are equally tied um, in terms of most likely to happen, is um, you know one allowing the highest tax bracket, you know the over four hundred thousand dollar tax bracket, to go from thirty seven percent, which it is today, back up to thirty nine point six percent or whatever it was. He. He did, you know, it was incorrect to say um, that that was the reign under Bush. And he corrected himself in the middle of the speech. He's like, when Bush took office, that is correct, because the first thing Bush did is he cut it. However, what is this to 35 percent? However, what is disingenuous is that with the Bush tax cuts, the alternative minimum tax still existed. So even though, you know, it, it was kind of a classic Republican move, oh, I'm giving you a rate increase but I'm not going to tell you about this other stuff <laughs> um, to make it all work out. Well, so even though the, the highest rate was 35%, there was a cut in the, in the capital gains tax rate, the alternative minimum tax basically took all that way and ended up back at a, kind of an effective 37% rate, which is what it is today. Um, it, so Trump, you know, to his credit, got rid of the alternative minimum tax. Actually, it was one of the biggest benefits that happened for our clients was getting rid of this shadow tax system um, that existed that you couldn't do anything about, which was, you know, the flat tax. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, you know, I don't think that one's that bad. I mean, you know, it, it's 2% rate increase. I think that one will probably stand, you know, it, it, it is an increase, but it's not that much of an increase on the highest um, income earners. And remember, it's going to be progressive. So it's not like on the full 400, it's just the first dollar after the 400. I think what will also probably happen is they'll probably allow some of the itemized deductions back, like the state tax deduction, stuff like that, that'll end up um, offsetting it. So I think I think that'll probably happen. And remember, that's going to happen no matter what anyway in 2025, when the individual rates that were part of the uh, Trump tax cuts expire anyway. So that's just like, hey, we're going to just accelerate by a year what was going to happen anyway. So I see that happening. I think on the estate tax, you know, if if everybody wants infrastructure, they got to pay for it somehow. Um, I think that you know, the person that I'm willing to roll over the bus on is the person who's dead and can't vote for me. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> you know, if if I was an elected official and I had to compromise, and I didn't want to get yelled at by my constituents. I probably would say dead people would be a good choice. <laughs> so, you know, I do, even though it would be new, I do see them rolling over on the dead people. Um, well, and, there goes the dead people vote. Sorry. Yeah, dead, yeah, I get you. So that, <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know. So, Cut but, that um, class out. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, kind of the, kind of the lot, the thought process behind that is that, you know, if, 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 I, if I'm trying to avoid capital gains tax because I'm trying to avoid it or I just don't want to pay it or whatever, I don't need the money, you know, that, that is being 
and I've got a massive built-in gain and I die and Gary's my son and he inherits it, you know, right now, Gary inherits it at, 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 at the day to death value. So that, that not only is there not an estate tax potentially, but that capital gain transaction is as if it never occurred. Um, it just goes away. Like it magically disappears um, through the current law. So I see them. So even though it would impact the living people, you know, it's still inherited money. Um, so I see them probably doing some combination of, you know, some form of the elimination of the step up in basis combined with, you know, either leaving the existing limit the same, but, you know, or rolling some of the existing limitations back, you know, because it affects so, so, you know, few people, when I say so few people, it would suck, but from a planning perspective, um, but at the same time, I see him kind of given, given ground on that. I, a lot of our clients are really concerned about the capital gains tax increase, which, you know, above a million dollars going to ordinary rates, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't see that happening. I, because if, if you just look at our client base and a constituency, you know, I don't, I understand how they're arriving at the 0.3% would be impacted by that. But the bottom line is every one of our clients is impacted by it because if you count the, the value of their business, most all of them are worth over a million dollars in a liquidity event situation. So there's going to be some planning that we can do around that in terms of, you know, structuring such that, you know, any, the limitation in any given year is less than a million dollars that we could plan around avoiding it. But I also see them not, you know, not messing with like, that. It, if they're going to compromise, they're going to compromise on that one. I think the other three, you know, probably going to go down. I think that there's a pretty good chance that the capital gain, we're still going to plan as if there might be an increase, but, you know, people that are like in panic mode, oh my God, I've got to sell my business tomorrow because I'm otherwise, you know, only going to get 80% for it next year because of the capital gains rate. I, you know, I don't, I see, I don't, I don't see that. I, I see some form of massive compromise on that piece of the puzzle. So tirade done. <laughs> so everybody mark your calendars and, and flag this edition when we put it up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel and we'll go back and we'll see how accurate it, he, uh, Adam is. He might even have a, an alternative career as a weather forecaster because I'll bet you he's more accurate than the weather guys. Except for Larry Sprinkle. Larry Sprinkle's pretty good. <laughs> Love Larry Sprinkle. <laughs> you think that's his real name? I don't know, but you couldn't you couldn't pick a better name for a weatherman. That's right. Well, um, okay. So I would like a bullet point list of all those things you just said, Adam. So that way we can check them off at that appointed time down the road. But um, so two things that have come up in the past week or so, even so last night after the speech was, okay, what, what did he just say? And so I found a, a good article as to, you know, what is the economic plan and kind of the three pieces of it. So um, if you'll indulge me, uh, I will kind of share some, what the, the kind of the, the summary of those things are. So um, the American Rescue Plan is part one. Uh, it was introduced in January. He passed it in March. Uh, and the basic elements of that plan are 1.9 trillion uh, is the dollar amount. It provides health care coverage for 97% of Americans in 10 years. It raises an additional 4 trillion in tax revenue by increasing the top tax rate to 39.6%. Um, taxing capital gains at ordinary rates and raising the corporate tax rate to 28%. It goes into forgiving student loan debt and making college free for those making up to 125,000, raises minimum wage, repeals right to work laws, expands the whole Buy America program, invests 1.3 trillion in infrastructure over 10 years and spends 2 trillion on clean energy during his first term as president. That's part one. Part two, the American Jobs Plan so that's the American Rescue Plan. The American Jobs Plan, as proposed, um, basically, and this, this overlaps with some of the other stuff, but um, more to infrastructure, 
uh, corporate tax changes in addition to raising the corporate tax, um, taxes on book income and profits of multinational corporations. And then you have the American Family Plan, which is uh, cost 1.8 million, increases taxes Brilliant. for wealthy, et cetera. So um, you have all this stuff now, which all this stuff sounds great, but it was funny. I think it was um, Chris Christie last night in between the president and the Republican response that said, uh, it's like he's a 15 year old with a credit card with no limit and is just going on a spending spree, which is kind of what it felt like listening to it and then reading it today. Again, great programs, but you can't produce money out of thin air. Um, and you'd have to tax a lot in order to make this stuff happen. So um, again, not, not getting political, I'm just saying that, okay, great ideas. And, and all presidents do this in their State of the, the Union address it is, is that they say all these great ideas, but they don't really talk about where the money's gonna come from for, for that. So secondly, focusing on the, um, the things that are right in front of us, the, the restaurant revitalization fund. So tomorrow at 9 a.m., the SBA will be ready to open up the portal for the, the $28.6 billion restaurant revitalization fund. So you can, um, he, here are some points for that if you're in that arena. So who can apply? It is restaurants, food stands, food trucks, food carts, caterers, bars, lounges, taverns, uh, bakeries, brew pubs, wineries, inns, licensed facilities that can uh, that produce alcohol or um, where you can taste, sample, or purchase products. So um, those are the people who can apply, and then they have um, basically they're suggesting that you register for an account in advance. Uh, you can start doing that. Um, they said starting tomorrow at 9 a.m., but I think that portal, they may try to open it before that. Review the official guidance, um, and they do have an application sample. And then, obviously, as we've always said, prepare the required documentation for that. So um, then there is the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant Program, which we've talked about before. It was put on hold because of technical difficulties. So that portal is back open as well. And um, you know, we've talked about who that applies to, but it's, it's the entertainment venues that have been shut down essentially. So uh, there's a really good article and where I'm pulling from is the SBEC website, which is the um, Small Business Entrepreneurial, I think it's a Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. So it's SBE Council. CIL council.org and there's a whole bunch of information on there about these different programs. The article was originally from many months ago, but they updated it uh, two days ago. So it's a good resource to have. So um, that's it. That's all I wanted to share at this point. Cool. Well, supposedly the printing presses are ready to roll, but they're waiting on ink and it's stuck somewhere between China and here. That's what I heard. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they said it was at the Suez Canal. I'm like, well, that's not the trade route. So I don't know. Maybe just something I read on the internet. I don't know. <laughs> so, hey, speaking of the restaurant thing, um, we got a really good word problem in this morning. Um, I will, this uh, organic eatery, which is really a cool concept, um, uh, will remain on there. But here's the deal. First of all, they have attended a number of our webinars. Awesome. Good to have you here. Here's the situation. All their locations are single member LLCs. They are disregarded entities owned by this master company, this parent company. The parent company is a partnership. One tax return is filed. Each member has their own EIN and bank account. Each location and entity applied for and received PPP funding individually. They have less than 20 locations, okay? Eight are open now. 
and a couple more opening soon. They're going to be completing one application under the parent LLC. And that's the question. It, do they do one or do they do 10 applications for the, the current 10 locations? Uh, so that's question one. If one application, should they submit bank statements three months for all 10 entities in addition to the other substantiating documents? So those are the first two questions and then we'll go on to another one. But I thought this is probably applies to a number of folks that have multi locations. Um, so it's a really good question that I don't know the exact answer to. Um, but my, my thought would be that you ultimately I would have thought that it would have followed the way that PPP followed, even which would have been at the entity locate entity level. Um, the only challenge that you got is that they're asking for you know sp some specific documentation like the tax returns and, and the transcript that you're only going to have one of, even though you have you know eight separate entities. But I would have thought the application would have been um, at the entity level, simply because that's where um, you know, that, that's where you're ultimately going to foot to, you know, how much do you actually get since it's a, you know, a, since it's an equation of a bunch of different factors, you know, some stores were open, you know, some stores weren't, some stores got PPP, some stores did not get PPP, all of that factors into the amount that's available to you through this grant. And the only way that you could prove that would be at the individual entity level that ultimately would foot up to your master tax return. But I would have thought that it would have been um, separate applications, but I'm going to have to, I'm, it's a good question. I'm going to have to look that up, but I would have thought that it would have been um, distinct, distinct applications um, because that's, you know, that part, part of that's also how they're factoring into how many corporate owned stores you could have before you're factored out. I think the number was like 20 corporate owned stores or something like that, Jack, before you're excluded from that. I would think the only way that you could do that would be, um, through the through a separate application process versus a one application process. Yeah, I think it, there's there's a number of issues with that situation. So first is is that and and I have a, a recent similar situation, but it's not separate entities. It's one entity that has multiple franchised units in different brands, but they're geographically located in proximity to each other. So they have employees that go between places, just depending on you know more management level employees, but they're shifting between all of them. They're employees of the one company. In this instance, you have separate entities. And so you have essentially separate economic units with profit, losses, employees, et cetera. So I would think, and again, this is my speculation because there's very specific um, association rules that need to be followed when you're making an application for an enterprise type system, which has a parent and subsidiaries. And I say subsidiaries, meaning legal subsidiaries with their own EINs and their own operations that are separately accounted for. Now to, to Adam's point is that when you have, um, it all rolls up into the tax return, I think the expectations would be that part of your documentation is showing the p &Ls of each of the individual LLC operating LLCs in order to be able to move forward with the application. The challenge is when you have uh, employees that are shared and whether it is officially shared, meaning that they're employees of the parent company that, and, and a lot of times you have this in on, again, the higher levels, the management levels where you have an employee of the parent company that is providing services to each of the operating units. And so, and you can do that a number of ways. You can have it as an employee of the parent, you, and which is basically leasing, lending the employee to uh, each of the operating companies and have an accounting for that, which is um, an expense and then, uh, you know, um, income to the parent or 
in a more sophisticated and I think crazy way, allocate the person's time to each of the entities and, and in a sense, get a paycheck from each of the entities, depending on how many hours they're putting in for each entity. So um, there's a lot of variables that go into. So that's why it's, it's a, well, this is kind of guidance, but we can't, you know, based on the facts that as, as Gary has shared that we could give you specifically and say, this is what you need to do moving forward. So, you know, happy to look into it further for you, but um, understand that these are the factors that would go into the right way of doing the reporting and the application. Yeah, it, it's interesting too, because one of the additional caveats here uh, was that four of the entities qualify for the grant and six don't. So um, that's interesting. They've tried to call SBA customer hotline. Uh, I think calling it a hotline could be a misnomer unless it's uh, about making you very upset. Maybe that's why it's called the hotline because they couldn't get anybody. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so hopefully that helps. Now we did get a little weigh in from one of our expert, um, you know, uh, people who routinely are on here. And uh, where are you? I saw this from, uh, where are you? I saw something from David and he said he agreed with us. So um, it's in the chat. Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah. We yeah. It, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was yeah, just going to say it, my scientific Google search for restaurant revitalization fund disregarded entity yielded no results, <laughs> which, which means there is thus not an answer <laughs> to this question. But considering that the grant's limited by, I mean, no matter what, you got to report at a physical unit level anyway, because it's based on like the max amounts based on a physical location. So that's why I just feel like it probably would be separate applications. Um, so I, I think that's what David was saying as well. Is that what he said in the chat? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It's good to have yeah, because, you here, man. Because because the tax, I mean, if you think about the grant itself, I mean, the tax return, the tax return itself is just ancillary information. What the, I mean, what they're really looking for is sales data. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mitch is next. Mitch, I am so disappointed. You've missed the last few weeks. Come on, man. I'm so disappointed. You're probably clearing some land. <laughs> That's good. Hey, uh, so the question is, any updates on the NC legislators approving PPP proceeds are tax deductible? We have good news for you. Well, I don't, I don't know if we have good news. I mean, well, other than we passed the House, they added unemployment, Senate still hasn't done anything as of now. So it's still not... It's not it's still not a, yeah, it's not, it's still not official yet, which is just still ridiculous. If I, was I haven't heard anything that, either. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like, it's like that. It's like that scene out of Apollo 13 when Tom Hanks says the clock is ticking. <laughs> it's like freaking checks are due May 17th guys. Get off your ass. <laughs> May 16th. <Yeah>. Midnight. <laughs> Oh, Mitch, it is good to see you here, buddy. Uh, yes, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so Robert has a question. He has a, he has a constitutional question <laughs> that I'm not sure I want to go into this one. <laughs> uh, could be a little bit dicey, but uh, yeah. So he said, uh, founding fathers believed that we the people phrase was referring to the government according uh, uh uh, evidently last night that was the frame of reference but i'm not sure i didn't hear that in school either but <laughs> so yeah I, I would also just you know the other thing on the restaurant revitalization fund you know i had a client call this morning where i misspoke and said that the grant was likely going to be taxable as most grants and credits are actually this one specifically called out is not taxable and you can also deduct the expenses so it's going to behave just like ppp at the federal level does which is good news I guess stay tuned on North Carolina then, right? <laughs> okay, Vicki, uh, where are you? Okay, here we go. 
HB 344 looks like it's been tabled in the Senate for now. What the heck? Finance Committee had a meeting this week, but it's not on their agenda. Vicki, can you rattle some cages? We have done our best. Um, we have been probably pretty annoying <laughs> to some of our legislators, <laughs> but it needs to be addressed. Good grief. All right. Any other questions out there? Surely you guys have some. We got a, a, a big crowd today. Probably need to have that State of the Union address more frequently. <laughs> I was going to say that Vicky scooped me a little bit um, because while you guys were talking, I was looking. Um, it, what's interesting is there's a, a Senate website and a House website, and they're interlinked with each other with respect to bills. So on the Senate side, it doesn't show any action, but on the House side, it shows, as Vicky said, which is it's been tabled in the form of referring to the Committee on Rules and Operations of the Senate. So it's, they're trying to figure out how to handle it rather than handling it is what that means. So, and that's as of the 26th, so a couple of days ago. Um, it passed the first reading, which doesn't really mean anything because they usually go through two or three readings out of the variations of it. But the fact that now they've referred it to a committee on, of the rules on how to handle stuff, then that means it's probably going to be delayed even more so than we even thought originally last week. In corporate America, we called that having a meeting about a meeting. <laughs> I mean, really, come on, man. <laughs> so, hi. Yeah, I know it's, 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 it's good to be in the company of only other three states in the United States that have not taken action on this issue. Wow, we're down to three out of 18? Yeah. Come on. All right. Any other questions out there regarding tax stuff, any of these myriad of programs that have either passed or are speculated to go forward? I don't know that we can do anything but speculate yeah. on speculations yeah. anyway, but... Yeah, I think probably the only other thing that I would add in for people um, that are that I've seen in the last month or so is that for pe for the, for people going through loan renewals right now, um, a lot of you know a lot of our clients had you know built up some extra cash associated with PPP funding grants or whatever, and you know loan covenants um, typically come in um, you know two flavors when it comes to your ability to repay um, the debt. And the terms that bankers typically use are either, you know, what's called a debt coverage ratio or, you know, a uh, fixed charge covenant, but they're basically the same thing, which is basically, you know, are you generating enough operating income to pay for the principal payments on your debt and then some version of your line of credit, whether it's the interest on your line of credit or your, um, you know, your, uh, you know, it, as if your line of credit had been turned out over a period of time. And kind of the minimum the banks are looking at, you know, is 1.25, which means that I'm generating enough operating income to pay on my dad's plus a little bit. Um, you know, in, in, in renewals, I mean, especially during a town term, they're looking for at least one you know, one times that, meaning I'm generating enough operating income to pay my debts without going backwards. Well, you know, probably about half the time, these covenants include distributions or member draws as if they were an expense, you know, and, and, you know, right, you know, rightfully so, I understand the bank's point of view, which is, hey, man, you could be making a lot of money, but, you know, you could be putting all in your pocket instead of getting me paid back. <laughs> I totally get it. The problem is that, you know, with a lot of these covenant calculations, since, the, since they were silent on what to do with PPP and said it's just subject to interpretation, you know, you're not getting a lot, you're not allowed to getting at, you're not allowed to um, add PPP into your income for the purposes of evaluating whether or not you match your covenant ratio. But then the only fair thing to do would be to remove it from any cash that you distributed to yourself for the purposes of calculating this covenant calculation. So, 
it's just, it's more, I know that's kind of wonky, but it's just more of an FYI that, you know, when it comes to doing your own covenant measures, don't forget to be consistent in the measurement. So if you're allowed to include PPP, probably should include it on the distributions piece of the fixed charge debt coverage ratio. If you're not allowed to include the, if you're not allowed to include it as a source of cash, then you should not include it as cash that you distributed to yourself. Otherwise, it's just like permanent working capital that got stuck on your balance sheet. So um, anyway, that, that's probably the only other thing that I'd see this week to occupy the space that we have available with this call, Gary. All right, cool. Um, we've got a couple more questions that have come in. So this is an interesting one and it is a serious question, okay? <laughs> Can we push off PPP forgiveness until 2022 so we have time to move to a different state and avoid the tax? It wouldn't matter because it's where you earned the income. So, you know, you're going to de been deemed to have earned the income in North Carolina. Secondly, North Carolina has taken the position that at the federal level, it's as you incurred the expenses versus when you're granted forgiveness. So you're, you're really kind of, you're stuck either way on this one, unless they fix it. Hopefully they will fix it. Yeah. Which FYI, you know, the current bill only has a 2020 fix. It doesn't have a 2021 fix. So presumably we're going to go through all this nonsense again for PPP too. Now you know what I really think of the General Assembly, Gary. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I'm like, I, I think anybody paying attention, especially if you're a business owner, you should be frustrated and you should be lighting up, uh, you know, the phone lines and emails to your representatives. We have been, and evidently it hasn't been quite enough yet. So we'll keep doing it. Um, so here's the next question. I was approved for, but did not draw down my EIDL in 2020, but now I'd like to take it. Do you know how to reactivate it? It is on the website as ready for signature, but the offer has actually expired, so I can't sign it. Hmm. That's a, I wouldn't, the only thing that I could, I don't know the answer to that. You know, they do have an email address you can email. So I would try that route or alternatively reapply and see what happens. The only issue that you would get into with the reapplication process, the reapplication process was supposed to be targeted towards economically distressed zip codes. So if you were in a good zip code at the first time that wouldn't have qualified under um, the second iteration, you might have a problem, but I probably would take one of those two routes. I would also see if your banker, even though the banker is not involved, is to see if they have any connectivity to maybe a pathway into that. I mean, it seems like it's a technical question um, on, sorry, if you can hear the blower going on outside. Has some, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll talk louder. So, um, but yeah, check, check that as well. Um, I'm not familiar with the functionality of that website, but sometimes there is a button that says, okay, resend because if it's still showing up is available and it's just, you know, they want to make sure that the actual person is activating it and not someone who found an older link and said, Oh, look, free money. I can go ahead and, you know, get into the system. So it's more of a, um, a, a fraud, a fraud prevention measure. Uh, and so you should be able to access it, but again, and I don't know particularly how to do that. Good questions today, man. None of these were softballs. I like that. So I have an offer for the people that have remained on. If you can hear me, I don't know how loud that is. It seems very loud because it's right outside my window. But um, so at the beginning of when I was starting to talk, which was sometime into the, the program when Adam was done with his uh, tirade, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, express something in a certain way from a certain movie, the, the, um, the pitch of my voice, et cetera. Now you two are not allowed to answer, but the first person who answers that, if you, if it sounded familiar to you, then you have a $10 coffee card in your future. So we'll see Free if anybody stuff. can figure that out. I like it. Free stuff. It's there's a theme here. Yep. So we'll see. Well, hit the chat. If you have the answer to that. And while you're thinking about that, 
and you know the the timer is going off in uh, your head. Here's the next question. I'd like to use my excess or excess PPP funds, potentially the EIDL, to buy out my partner. Ooh, is that prohibited? Can you review any limitations you know for the PPP or EIDL? Well, it it kind of goes back to. Um, yeah, I mean, very, you know, very specifically, you know, you can't take loan proceeds and then turn around and use it to pay off debt or refinance debt or, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, that, that is pretty crystal clear on. At the same time, if you use the money, but otherwise have excess retained earnings, did it come from the PPP loan or did it come from excess retained earnings? Who knows? So, I think that's really not any different than the than the than can I distribute extra cash to myself as a question. The answer to that is yes, you should be able to. There's nothing, there's nothing that prohibits you from um, distributing cash to yourself, and in this case, distributing cash to um, your owner to buy your your partner to buy them out. Um, what they didn't want to see is like a direct, you know, correlation or one to one correlation. But I feel like there's enough time that's passed that you know, no different than distributing it to yourself. You should be able to do whatever you want with it at this point. Yeah, I'm now he's really right outside the window, but if you can hear me. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the EIDL is less restrictive than the PPP, but, and, and I think it really depends upon, you know, there were certain restrictions about, again, spending on yourself, but, um, you know, if it had to be directly related to performance of services, so no dividends and things like that. So there's certain rules associated with it. I've not seen a restriction on buying out, paying out to, um, to buy someone else out because, you know, it, I guess, practically speaking, unless you have the cash, um, you're going to be asking for a loan. Um, and with the EIDL being as, as restrictive. Now, does that mean that an EIDL loan that did not ask for a guarantee or some sort of collateral, then does that change the nature of it? And now does there have to be some sort of collateral against the assets of the company in order to use those funds that way? And I'm totally making that up. I don't know if that's the case, but it seems logical that if you know, you're going to use it for something like that, then there may be more strings tied to what you need to do in order to use those funds that way. But then the practical application of that is, how are you going to notify them about that? Is it really loud? It's, it, a, it's just hilarious to me. That, you know, we got- Every time, every time, yeah. It, it doesn't matter whether it's the FedEx guy or the guys installing carpet or the guys blowing. It's just part of how we've had to adapt and overcome. It's, it's actually funny, so keep going. <laughs> yeah, well, it usually doesn't come until after lunch and I don't know why it's here now, but of course, yeah. because of, it's the karma thing, right? So um, <laughs> but anyway, so I, I would, uh, you know, we can look into that further uh, about using that, but I would say, you know, go back to the EIDL, um, the, the portion on the website on SBA that talks about EIDL and see if there's something in there for that. Yeah, I kind of, the, the way that I think about it is, you know, and this is more specific to PPP, but it can apply to EIDL too, is, you know, if I started with a dollar in the bank, I received a dollar in PPP funding, and then I earned a dollar, I now have $3. <laughs> if I then pay out a dollar, which bucket did it, I mean, which bucket did it come from? <laughs> That's why I feel like, you know, I think what they didn't want you to do is try to ask for forgiveness for buying out your partner. Well, you didn't do that. You spent it <laughs> you know, on, on the appropriate funds. You just happen to also have some extra money in the account since things were, since cash was commingled. So. Well, that makes sense. But for anybody that wasn't on last week's webinar, go back to the YouTube channel and go back to the part where Adam was um, trying to help tutor a, a law student and everything that he guessed 
based on common sense was wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> that was actually pretty funny. Oh man. All right. Any other questions out there? You guys have been great. These have been great questions. But I'm I'm really quite disappointed. Nobody has figured out Jack's, you know, evidently they weren't paying attention on the front end or your clue is terrible. I don't know. Do you guys know? Do either of you know? What was no. the question again? <laughs> the inflection that I used when I, fir when I first talked about the Restaurant Revitalization Act having a deadline tomorrow or having a start time tomorrow at 9 a.m. Nah, that was too up. You'd have to do the, you'd have to do the inflection again. <laughs> Oh, hey, right. yeah, that, I like that. Okay, I will uh, do it again. So um, tomorrow, 9 a.m., the SBA is going to show up. Come on, it's a is classic it my, movie. My cousin Vinny, like my biological clock's ticking like this, which one? Uh -uh. <laughs> well, it wasn't good okay. in Vietnam, so. It's a holiday movie. How about that? I'm giving away, too, I'm Chris, giving away money. Oh, Chris, a holiday Christmas movie. Vacation? No. Nope. Christmas Vacation? Okay. The other classic. Home Alone. No. <laughs> a Christmas story. That's the only one that's left out there. Oh no. You're gonna clue. you're gonna kick yourself. Elf. I guess I'm not oh, that oh, good at elf. inflecting my voice. Elf. Yes. Mitch. Mitch got it. All right. Okay. With, Mitch, Mitch you win. With Gupton Land Clearing. Rock on, Mitch. You've totally redeemed yourself. What movie is that from? <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Awesome. So here's the next question. Do you know if Healthcare Provider Fund is still making grants? It was part of the CARES Act. Oh, wow. This is going back 13 months. Um, I don't know if that pool has been exhausted or not, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know either. I'd have to look and see what that, I, I don't think that there was an expiration date, but I just don't know if there's still money in that pot. All right. Any other questions out there? Anybody that came on late, you're forgiven. Um, and you can find out the front end of this thing if you want to on the BGWCPA YouTube channel. It will be up later on today. Um, does anybody know how many weeks we've done this now? That's another question. Are you giving away my coffee cards now? You know, I want to do that. I actually want to do that next week for a specific reason, but um, I'm going to save that one for next week. I'll, I'll give a coffee card if someone knows the right number. Because I don't know. I'd like to know. You don't know? Well, I, I have an estimate. Oh, it, you're close. You're close, Robert, but not quite. Not quite. Next week. Next week. <laughs> oh, oh, that's funny. Uh, how do I register for the, or how do I redeem the coffee card I earned Me? four weeks ago? Oh, what? Oh, maybe that's the one that we didn't know about. Uh, yeah. And I am sorry, I was going to go back and watch the video to see who it was because I didn't remember. And I asked my co host and they weren't sure either. So, but sorry, it's my, it's, we all dropped the ball. It's they, my responsibility. Yeah, it's my stuff. We all dropped so, the ball. Deal with it. Okay. Well, now I know. So, next week, stay tuned. I'm going to write that down. How, Don't how forget. Many weeks we've done this. Um, all right. Any other questions? Last call on, on questions. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, you've got the, uh, the address there, Jack, for David. Yeah, I think I do. Yep. All right. Great. Sorry, David. We weren't trying to shun you or disrespect you or take what's rightfully yours. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you, guys. Uh, we really appreciate you guys jumping on here and uh, giving us great questions. I mean, this is good. It's, it's anybody that's on here for continuing it is actually learning something <laughs> so <laughs> all right we're gonna sign off uh jack adam any last comments nope i can think of guys
All right. Have a good rest Have of the week. Wonderful rest of the week. Enjoy this beautiful weather. See you.